Hello and welcome to Switzer TV Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. On tonight's show, we will look at the outlook for stocks with the economy reopening and the economic news improving. But we'll also look at the threats to this positivity from Donald Trump and his hate session on China. And we'll look for stocks to make money out of this China drama or ones that might offer safety in case Donald's China bashing leads to a trade war and stock market fall like it did in 2018. Well last Wednesday Comsex Craig James wrote a headline which went green shoots of recovery and what he underlined was something I've been tracking writing and talking about and that's the seven weeks in a row of rises for the ANZ slash Roy Morgan Consumer Confidence Index. Now before the coronavirus crash it was 112 and after slumping to 65.3 in early March it's now at 92.3. It's a really big rebound and we've now heard that only three 3 million workers are on JobKeeper's $1,500 a fortnight rather than the 6 million that we thought would be there. These are very positive things for the economy and probably makes a lot of people think maybe the forecast that the economy was really going down the spout with 10% unemployment, maybe these forecasts are a little bit more negative than they needed to be. Meanwhile, Perse Allen's chart, uh, which we'll show on screen right now, it actually shows that the market is actually, the stock market, it has a lot of positivity in the short term and uh, those charts are something we're going to look at later in the show as well. So putting these together, the view on the economy and the market remains more positive than you would have expected four or five weeks ago. Of course, second wave infection could spoil this positive party and so could a Donald Trump China trade war with the US president possibly playing an anti-China card to win electoral favour before the November election. And looking at this chart, you could see why. This graph from project538.com of only three days ago shows he's not traveling well in the polls. The orange line is his disapproval rating. The green line is his approval. And as you can see, it's not a great story. So increasingly market experts are starting to worry about a Donald versus Xi Jinping battle. And so we will spotlight this on tonight's show. Let's kick off with Julia Lee from Berman Invest. Well, joining us on the show first, as she always does, well, unless the guest is Harry Dent. And boy, Harry rated his socks off last. Yeah, Julie, you got to get as scary and as crazy as Harry to bring the numbers in. But still, you're a big um, crowd puller as well. Julia Lee from Berman Invest. Thanks, Pete. <laughs> Well, some of the stocks on the market have been doing extremely well. I mean, what an amazing day today. The market was up by more than 2%. Mm. I think I've spoken about some of those stocks um, buying in after the capital raisings, and they've been performing quite well. In fact, Webjet is up about 50% from the price we bought it at and up 15% today. So um, certainly there seems to be a little bit more optimism yeah. on the Aussie share market, especially those related to the lifting of those lockdowns. Yeah. I'm really happy I stuck my neck out on Webjet because we had John Gusick on the program you know, before coronavirus. He did tip that things would get worse than uh, <laughs> they actually happened. But it's good to see that it has rebounded. I guess what we need to see for a lot of these stocks to stay up is normalcy returning and no terrible second wave infections and something I know you want to talk about no big problems between China and Donald Trump Absolutely. The tensions between the US and China, well, we know how much havoc that can wreck on markets. We've been through it the last few years. And whenever those tensions spike, we see volatility coming back to markets. I think the last thing the world needs at the moment is not only the travel restrictions, but trade barriers. So that's a key to be watching. And of course, here in Australia, China is our largest export partner. So some of the areas that could be at risk are things like coal as well as agricultural products. And the reason I say coal is because China is 93% self-sufficient in terms of thermal coal, which is used in electricity. It's 87% um, self-sufficient in coking coal, which is used in steel. 
But if you have a look at the area of iron ore, it's only 23% self-sufficient, which means it is reliant on the export market and especially on Australian iron ore miners because Australian iron ore miners actually make Chinese product specific to the way the steel mills want them. So even though they want to switch to another product, it's hard to do. Um, not only that, the other product would be Brazil, which is probably susceptible to lockdowns at the moment mm. given their bad COVID-19 situation over there in Brazil. And of course, Australia is much closer to China. I think it takes about 12 days to ship out iron ore from Australia to China, whereas it takes about double that time to ship from Brazil to China. So look, I think the iron ore miners will be okay. And not only that, I think we will see iron ore strength in the short term, given the situation in Brazil and uh, the uncertainty around the supply of iron ore at the moment. Now, Julia, I very seldom get you to talk about something as boring as dividends. You're, you're not a dividend kind of girl. You're capital growth and whatever. But a lot of people have bought the miners on the belief that their dividends are sustainable. Do you think BHP and Rio will keep on paying the good dividends, at least for this year? Yes, I absolutely do. And I guess that's the key when you're looking at investing for dividends, that you look for companies that are able to maintain earnings or increase earnings. Really, when dividends are at risk is when you do see the earnings outlook deteriorating quite rapidly. So the fact that we are seeing the miners holding up very well, in fact, iron ore prices have held up well, and gold prices as well means that those traditional payers of dividends in those sectors are likely not only to keep on paying dividends, but perhaps even increase dividends, unlike a lot of those traditional dividend payers on the market, like the real estate investment trusts, where we are seeing deferred, cut or even cancelled dividends. Mm. A company that I often get a question about um, with our latest Boom Doom Zoom program on, on Wednesdays at lunchtime um, is around Monodelphus, because it always has been a, a good service providing business really copped it when the mining boom went off the boil. What's your view on Monodelphus, um, Julia? <laughs> it's funny you mentioned Monodelphus. Uh, we just bought into Monodelphus uh, last week because it does look like it has been oversold. Look, Monodelphus does come under pressure when economic conditions deteriorate. And um, we just saw that during the global financial crisis. So with COVID-19, I guess there has been a question mark on whether we are seeing some of those miners deferring things like maintenance to uh, their projects. Um, so watching that very closely, but at these levels, I've just started to dip a toe in. Mm and started to accumulate some of Monodelphus' stocks. I think a lot of it is reoccurring revenue. I'm just watching to see whether we do see some deferral of maintenance as well as new projects coming online. But we have seen iron ore prices holding up fairly well here. Um, but Monodelphus was sold off today, down another 2%. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I know that 10-year period we both did on Sky News Business, so many times that company Monodelphus was a, a darling of the market until the mining boom off the boil. But I always figured that its underlying structure as a business must be pretty good. Is that a fair call? Yeah, look, I like Monodelphus. I like uh, Seven as well, Seven Holdings. And look, Cube Logistics looks pretty interesting here as well if you ha are looking at uh, the transportation space. Mm -hmm. So looking at that industrial space, there are a few interesting companies in that space. Of course, today in the industrial space, it was all about those travel stocks. So Sydney Airports did well, Auckland Airports, we saw Qantas doing well, mm -hmm. uh, Transurban also rising on, um, I guess, the post-COVID-19 mm -hmm. trade. But also, Julia, um, given the fact that there was a bit of a sensational news around um, the Treasurer's so-called cock-up, I think uh, that's the way um, um, Paul uh, Curry in the AFR <laughs> called it, um, when you look behind it, if we were expecting 6 million people to be on JobKeeper and there's only 3 million, is it potentially a sign that maybe the Aussie economy will not be the worst case scenario, but might be the better case scenario where unemployment might max out at seven or 8% rather than 10%? 
It could be. I think the government's still predicting that we are going to see the unemployment rate maxing out at 10%. So those forecasts look like, look like they have been unchanged. A lot of it is going to depend when those uh, key industries that have been hit, like uh, hospitality and travel, can come back again. But the fact we are starting to see borders opening up, mm. perhaps some travel to uh, New Zealand as well, means that we will start to see some areas start to see some cash flow coming through and hopefully start that path to revival. Mm. I'd like to see the advanced bookings for Port Douglas in winter and Gold Coast and Sunshine Coast for the, the Christmas holidays. I think there'll be a lot of locals who generally go overseas who will be looking for the best destinations in Australia. Oh. And Australians spend so much money on travel. If we were to keep that domestically, the travel industry would be booming by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So if we do see Australians reallocating their travel funds from overseas travel to domestic travel, that would be a huge plus for the domestic industry and getting it back on track. But I guess the market has been thinking about COVID-19 and it's interesting seeing some of those travel statistics in other countries, not so much in terms of aeroplanes, but in terms of roads. Some of the US highways, we are seeing uh, travel uh, statistics now back to pre-COVID-19 levels. And in China, just a few months after their COVID-19 crisis, we are seeing major highways seeing year-on-year -year growth. Now, part of that's probably because instead of using public transport, people are wanting to use cars mm. instead. So it could be that after uh, this uh, crisis has passed and the lockdowns, we come out of those lockdowns, that we are going to see a lot more people traveling in cars. And that, of course, have, has implications for toll roads, uh, car sales, as well as AP Eagers, which sells cars. So it's interesting to watch that. And the U.S. automakers as well have been reporting uh, week on week rises mm. in terms of car sales for the last three or four weeks. Yeah, what about a company like Babcorp that really Philip Heck Van Dyke always loves? Yeah, Babcorp should be a, a beneficiary of that as well. The more cars are on the road, yeah. the more parts that we're going to need. So Babcorp should definitely do well if we do see that trend come to, into fruition like we have in other countries like the US and China. Well, Julia, let's keep our fingers crossed. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Pete. Well, I don't call myself a chartist, but I always do look at the charts because I always like to think that my fundamental va uh, values are actually in line with what the charts are saying. So if I'm positive and the charts are positive, that makes me feel more confident about my investments. A guy who spends a lot of time looking at charts, of course, is Michael Gable from Fairmont Equities. And Michael joins us right now. Hi, Michael. Hi, Peter. Now, I asked you to do two big charts. Uh, rather specific companies. I want to know what the market is saying about itself. So let's click kick off first of, of all with the ASX 200 chart and tell us what we're looking at. Yep. Look, at the end of the day, I think our market can continue to push higher. Um, so what our, uh, what our market's showing here uh, on the chart uh, is that it is starting to, to break out from its recent consolidation and head higher. So if we start by looking at the March low, we can see our market uh, rallied for a few weeks there. Uh, and then it did spend a little bit over a month across uh, April, May, um, heading sideways to consolidate that move. So the, the blue lines that I've got there are showing the fact that our market's consolidating that move. Any selling pressure has been met with equal buying pressure. Uh, and in the last few days, where we were stuck under um, a level around 5,500, um, for the ASX 200. Uh, we've now broken through that uh, and it now looks as though we will head higher. So I think in the next several weeks, our market can aim for 6,000. Yeah, so Michael, for people who aren't experts on the charts, the, the, the top line, which you call the blue line, um, is it, sort of pretty well flat, but as you, as you can see there, it's broken above it. That's one thing. Yeah. And yeah. Then, then on the bottom, it seems that li that line going up is saying that we've been making higher lows for quite some time. <laughs> I've taught you well, Peter. You have. Exactly. Yeah. You've got some good uh, higher lows there. So that's basically people buying the dip. I think I think investors, uh, and not all of them yet, but there are investors coming to the realization that there's a very very small chance we're going back to the March lows. Back in March, there was. You know, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of concern about 
where this would lead us. We thought we'd be in lockdown until September. We thought there'd be tens of thousands of deaths in Australia. And clearly the news flow is showing us that uh, it's not as bad as what we first thought. So those who are sitting uh, with a lot of cash on the sidelines are starting to realise that any time this market dips, they're going, they're going to have to get involved. Mm. And I mean, I don't want to sound so bullish that I think the market's going back to 7,000 anytime soon. I mean, of course, it doesn't deserve to be there, but it doesn't deserve to be back under 5,000. And I think um, an acceptable level um, is still higher than where we are now. And I think that's um, with a six in front of it. Okay, let's go to the next chart. And this is the S&P 500, top 500 companies in the US in terms of its market cap listed on the stock exchange. And this one, they've got a, it, it's very hard not to call this a real V. And, and it looks as though market's still promising to go higher. Is that a fair call? With, with the US market, they've, they have bounced a lot harder than ours. There is more of a V there. Um, obviously, they've got a lot of tech stocks which have mm. helped their market. And on our side, we've got a lot of banks. So they're not doing us any favours in terms of the index. But with the US market, what I'm trying to show here with the horizontal blue lines is that it is trading in a band where it will get a lot of resistance. So we've mentioned this um, over the last few weeks. I think the US um, is now hit a level where it's likely to consolidate and head sideways. So I think in the short term, in the next few weeks or so, um, I think the Aussie market can outperform the US here um, while the US consolidates that, that big V move that it that it had um, several weeks ago. Yeah, and I was just saying to uh, Andre, our brilliant uh, director here, um, he'll like me saying that. He deserves an occasional praise. Uh, <laughs> but he's also hanging off every investment word we share on this program so he can make money. But the, the interesting thing about the American situation is, as an economy and as a country trying to take on the coronavirus, uh, um, they haven't done as well as us. You know, our, mm. yeah, we've really done well on the health stakes. And even the information about JobKeeper, only six, uh, three million rather than six million, it all kind of augurs well that maybe our economy can, can really do well in the, the back uh, half or last quarter of uh, 2020. We kind of deserve to have a, a much better V than we've currently got. And their V is probably a little bit excessive. But you make the point, it's, it has been driven by those great, Fang companies, mm. haven't it? Hasn't it? Yeah, that's that's right. So what what you're describing, Peter, is you're basically coming back to what we said at the top there, which is our market in the short term at least should have more upside from here. There's more, you know, we've got this good news flow, um, and we're starting to digest that. And you know, as as much as we can make fun of uh, the fact that they've had this uh, this big um, sort of miss, uh, you know, they've they've miss. Uh, you know, mistimed the, the job, job keeper mm. amounts. I almost got it out there. Um, <laughs> you know, at the, at the end of the day, that's that's obviously positive news. As you say, it's mm. implying there's there's less people that deserve um, those benefits, meaning more people working. So the, the news flow does continue to look uh, more and more positive, and, and that's why the market's going up. All right, and I guess the only thing that would make you look wrong would be some curveball from a surprise left field. Yeah, look, I, I mean, uh, of course, I, you know, I'm entitled to change my mind if circumstances change, but based on current circumstances, the market should head up. And, and just one more thing to bear in mind, a lot of people are scared about a second wave uh, of infections. I think if we did see a rise in infections, I think what we understand now compared to a few months ago in terms of how we can deal with it, how we can, um, you know, deal with it from a health point of view and from an economic point of view, it's a lot better than what it was a few months ago. So I think that, um, again, those those levels of fear where our market was down towards 4,400 in March, mm. it'll, it'll take a lot to get it down there again. Mike Gable from Fairmont Equities, thanks for joining us. Well, as I said earlier in the program, um, things are starting to look pretty good stock market-wise, and even some of the economic readings are surprisingly better than expected. But out there, a lot of people are worried, uh, experts in the market are worried about the, the Donald Trump-China battle that's emerging and getting worse by the day. Could this actually threaten this recovery of the stock market? 
To talk about this, I've got my old mate Charlie Aiken from Aiken Investment Management, and of course, I better call him my old mate Paul Rickard as well from the Switch Report. Otherwise, he might feel as though he's been, you know, mistreated. I might feel like I'm not your mate. Is that <laughs> yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. Well, you're not old either. All right. So. I'll take the not old part, Peter. <laughs> okay. So, guys, let's start. Charlie, you in particular are more worried about this than, than mm. Paul. Kick off oh, and give I'm concerned because it's not mm. just Donald Trump versus uh, China. It's the whole world versus China. Yeah. It seems to be a little bit at the moment, including Australia, which is... But the world used to be more politically. Yeah, but I think this is. Correct. I, I, I am more concerned time. that about what happens between now and the U.S. presidential election. Mm. I think the rhetoric is really going to step up. I think that President Trump's in a place where he has to take the fight to China to try and somehow justify what's happened. Well, his, his own approval backup. rating is really low. And, at the and you know, the, and the Chinese even today, you know, the, you know, some of the actions in Hong Kong are quite controversial. Obviously, mm. and you've seen the Hong Kong share market fall six percent in two days. And the, and the yuan, the, the Chinese currency, just went to the lowest uh, price in, they, they fixed the price the lowest in since 2008. So it, it's like there is, a, the, the tensions are rising. That is the bit that I'm not very comfortable with, but I'm just monitoring. And, and back in 2008, when, the, when there was a trade war on, it was very hard for people who were invested in China, as well as the US. The market well, I, I can tell anyway, you firsthand, I had a terrible year that year investing because mm. we were too invested in China. Mm. So even at the first inkling of this, you know, <clears throat> ratcheting up, I've dramatically reduced our exposure directly to China just because you, you know you just don't want to be there directly if this escalates further. Mm. Paul? Look, I'm also worried, Peter. I think you probably did me a little bit of disservice by saying I was less worried than oh, China. Oh, sorry, I think please. actually, uh, in some ways, this is a bigger risk than the second wave. I think if anything, the, the second wave stuff is a little bit over beaten up. Mm. Um, markets is probably through that. They don't expect some inspection <coughs> rates to pick up at some stage. Yep. I think markets are ahead of themselves, but that's because all the cash that's going around. And as we were saying a little bit off air, you know, the shorters have been killed. And, you know, and it's the only way to play this, this, this market's almost from the long side. But this mm. is worrying tension because, you know, the election's still in November. It looks like, you know, uh, I think the, the polls said Trump got a bit of a bump last week when he started attacking China. It mm. looks like he sees that as a way to um, deflect attention about his handling of the crisis and beat up uh, Joe Biden and mm. others. Mm. And so I, I do think the signs are, are, are bad in, in that sense. So, and from the Australian market, that's... Although we might be a short-term winner if there's problems in Hong Kong, it's mm. possibly uh, we've got more to lose than this because we're sort of you know, collateral damage in these wars. Mm. So, but Charlie, if Trump takes on China and he recreates the 2018 trade war issue, remember the stock market fell a lot. So if he's going to be seen as the president who didn't handle the coronavirus very well and then Wall Street takes a set against him, his, his only constituency then becomes like the, the rednecks or the, the rusted on yeah. GOP men. Well, it, it is interesting though, because I think that, I think that he's going to do it differently. I and mean, you can see it's already started in, in Washington. I think they're going to reduce Chinese companies' ability to get US capital via the share market, via the ADR market. And that has ramifications for everything up to even Alibaba. Mm -hmm. And that you've come to our market, you know, you seek our capital. Some of you have been fraudulent, they'll use that as a cover story and try and push, America, push Chinese companies off American exchanges. Mm. So I don't think that he's going to be as stupid to try and introduce tariffs again and crash the markets, mm. but selectively reduce the ability for Chinese companies to access US capital markets. Mm. And that's a pretty big event. But what could China do in retaliation then? Ask for their money back? <laughs> well, sell US bonds, yeah. you know, try and send, set the, sell the, uh, put the price of US money up. Mm. But look, or devalue their own currency, which they did today, mm -hmm. lots of things. Yeah. So I, I just think it just requires a bit of monitoring. I mean, well, I think it's interesting to see that um, the commentary about the, um, the Chinese action on Bali. I mean, remember China's got to buy more agricultural goods mm. from the US as part of the previous trade deal. My point is sort of Australia can get caught up as, as being damaged in this because as the two big guys play mm. it out, yeah. Poor old Australia, you know, we sort of do some of the things at the behest of call of yeah, the of US administration. Other things we can get beaten up by, you know, the Chinese pick something that they can import from the US. So mm. it's sort of, um, there's, I think there are risks for some of our companies here that maybe just got to be a little cautious now in our market. Okay. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. There's some things that are flying high at the moment, be it iron ore or baby or infant milk formula. Mm that could easily get a shot out of left field out of Beijing, mm. just, just if this really does escalate. I'm not saying that's necessarily going to happen, but you've seen Bali, you've seen a few other things, and it's quite targeted. Mm. Would you prefer a different kind of American president? I'm not saying Biden, but a different kind of president to handle the situation? Because let's face it, 
you know, six weeks ago, we were worried about the coronavirus mm. taking the stock market down. What we were down about 38%. Mm. The Americans were similar numbers, 35% or so. And now we had a nice rebound. Is this the kind of thing that could ruin well, a nice recovery? Well, it's interesting. I'm absolutely in Paul's camp that I'm not as concerned about a second wave of coronavirus. Mm. I think that we potentially know how to handle that. What I am concerned about is a major escalation in you know, trade, whatever you want to call it, mm. uh, trade, trade war between the two biggest economies in the world again. Yeah. I mean, that, that is a major event. And yes, could it derail the market? Absolutely. It could. Are you, do you have exposure to companies like Alibaba? Well, we actually made, an ex we made a decision on Friday at the, cha at the new rules coming at, potentially coming into Hong Kong to cut, to cut Tencent down. So yeah. we did that on Friday. We've kept Alibaba, which actually had a good result, but it was only a couple of percent of our fund. Mm. But they're down about 7% in two days. Mm. But they could be forced to relist their entire listing from New York to Hong Kong. I mean, that would be a big event. So, mm. it is all, so we're small, very small directly in China now. But... We're monitoring it, and I'm definitely not a buyer yet. One thing I did learn in 2018, when this got messy, you get a big margin of safety in Chinese assets when they're, when they're really out of favour. Yeah. So I'm just sitting there watching now after reducing our 10 cent cool. exposure on Friday. Should we look at this and say, use the Buffett um, advice, be a buyer or be greedy when everyone is look, fearful? I think I think. Um, well, I think ultimately yes, Peter, but I think it's too early because yeah. the fear is only just just starting there. Simmering. It's simmering, and uh, look, it may all just wash over. You know, mm. I mean, um, he's good at creating diversions, and um, you know, so I think it's probably too early to be get jumping in there. But I just think it's just time to be wary. The markets, particularly the U.S. market, had a good bounce, uh, and maybe there's some other risks just starting to come up there. But I, I do say in the context of what this has shown us is there's so much cash out there, Peter, mm, mm. Uh, and it's got to find a home somewhere. So mm. it's still probably going to be a market to buy when, you know, mm. to buy the dip market store, uh, I think. I, I read something today which quite surprised me from a currency strategist who said that the Australian dollar could actually go up on a China-US trade war. Yeah, I find that difficult to believe. Yeah, it did, me too. didn't last time. I, no. I, I would not be in that camp. No, me I, I would think that the risk to the currency is clearly to the downside yeah. in that scenario, unless I'm missing something on the direction of the US dollar. Mm. That, that would not be my view. Okay. Have you bought anything in America recently, Charlie, apart from your usual Microsoft? You, 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 well, we're you should actually, be wearing Microsoft t-shirts. Yeah, no, we're actually a bit in Paul's camp now, just doing a tiny bit of trimming and things that we may, not, not exiting, just a mm. tiny bit of trimming and things that have potentially done a little bit too well. Yeah. That would include like the Apple Computer Company, which mm. is almost back to an all-time high. Took a little bit of profit in Netflix and things that have done really, really well in that mm. stay-at-home trade. So we, you know, we don't do any shorting or anything. We've got a little bit of cash waiting for, you know, to deploy it through time. Mm. But I think where everything's got back to, it's quite interesting. We did some analysis on the what's performed and what hasn't performed in America. It's really come down to balance sheet. Double A rated and triple A rated mm. equities have absolutely dominated in terms mm. of performance. They mostly happen to be large cap tech companies due to the amount of cash they have on their balance sheet. Yeah. Anything with a B or C rated balance sheet has been absolutely hammered. So. Mm. The, the market's been reasonably rational in America, but it's fair to say we've just done a little bit of trimming just to make sure that mm. we're being prudent. Paul, what have you been buying? Look, I've been taking part in these share purchase plans, Peter, as, as you know, because they were too cheap. And, mm. um, you know, and unfortunately, some of the retail shareholders got uh, badly hammered. I mean, I think a lot of directors have done their retail shareholders a disservice by mm. this. Let's hope the NAB directors see a bit of sense and uh, make their NAB share purchase plan more than half a billion dollars because it's going to get massively oversubscribed, yeah. Peter. So we'll find out that probably on Wednesday. I think the stocks I still like, are, I'm a bit wary of some of the tech companies. I think Afterpay is almost at $50. You've got to be, yeah. you know, it's almost in our top 20 companies. It may almost be a top 20 company, I don't know. But I still think Zero has got, is, is probably the company to play there. Mm. Um, I right, think, right, yeah. and, and, and no, I can't see that one getting caught up in the, in, in no. any uh, China, US China trade war. So no, it's, it's, a, it's a company that's basically leveraged to the local small business yeah, and fraternity, and a USA and, and UK. USA and, the, and, and, and the UK. So I think it's, a, it's, it's on a good footing. And it, could be, it could even be a takeover target for a big company like Intuit, couldn't it? There's going, to be a lot, God, there's going to be a lot of change I react in the back of this in terms of, you know, not just COVID-19, you know, the trade war, where people manufacture, well, onshoring. Mm. This, this is going to go on for years. So oh. I'll tell you one we have added to. It's actually Accenture in the US, one that gives out yeah. uh, business advice to people have to think about onshoring yeah. and how the new world looks. So that's mm. one we have added to. Mm. It was something that came out of Arthur Anderson. Yeah. Arthur Anderson something had, like that. Had a, <laughs> <shocker>. <laughs> <laughs> Enron, think, Anderson, a shock. Enron, I think. Enron, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but one last yeah. thing before yeah. we go. Um, I read something brilliant um, today, which I actually wrote, um, and, and I put together the fact that 
uh, we saw that JobKeeper only went to three million rather than six million. Um, con- yeah, I don't know if you've been watching the ANZ. Roy Morgan consumer confidence has risen seven weeks in a row. It was it was 112 before the the coronavirus crash. It's now up to 92.3. So consumers are reacting positively to, the, you know, the just good. Happy they didn't die. Yeah, well, yeah. that's right. <laughs> good point. But but the thing is this. If this, and, and like therefore the 10% unemployment number may well end up being a, an 8 or a 9 rather than a 10%. If this is the case, does this all go well for those people who are buying bank stocks now with the view that in six months' time or a year's time, if this recovery is better than expected, so, so will the share prices of those banks? Well, I think so, Peter. I mean, I think, first of all, I think you can read the JobKeeper um, bungle as being it's actually a positive. Yes. Because I think what it tells you, there are less people impacted by... It's not so much the gear and how they miscounted it up front, but less people said they didn't need to have their employees on JobKeeper. Mm. Not too many employee, employers look a, look a gift horse in the mouth, right? Yeah. So that's actually the, the positive side of the story. Yeah. And secondly, it's positive in the sense that we still have this cliff coming in September mm. when everything comes due. The government's now in a stronger position to think about some transition. So if they can do that, I think those, both those two are positives for banks. Mm. Um, we saw a little bit of reaction today. Not a lot, Peter. Banks have been left behind. Yeah. They're still seen as the risk stocks. And there's still if, question marks. And there's still question marks because no one knows exactly how it's mm. going to play out. But uh, I'd say, yeah, I think that both those two things actually support banks looking reasonably attractive. Uh, yeah, I, I don't disagree with that, but it's also, look, I just want to get to September with this thing or whenever it ends yeah. and then see what happens from there. It is a form of morphine, we all know it. Yeah. That's worked brilliantly. It was a great idea. They put in very quickly, acted very quickly and stabilised the economy yeah. and made, made the situation less worse than it could be. So that's you know, full credit to that. I always wondered how the number was 6 million though. That seemed a huge mm. number. Like, I, I just couldn't quite work out. I didn't know there was an error, obviously, but 6 million seemed a huge number. Yeah. And look, it's, it is a good piece of incremental news, but let's, let's just, we just want to see people re-employed, mate. We don't want job cleaver. We want people back, yeah, we, we yeah. want them back to work. We want, no, but know, fortunately, you get people back we to might work, get football get, crowds by July. No, <laughs> have football yeah. crowds back before people are working, but we need back people to work, yep. the bank shares will go up, Peter. It's okay. as simple as that. That's uh, Charlie Aitken from Aitken Investment Management and Paul Rickard from The Switzer Report. Well, that's the show for tonight. Thanks for joining us. If you're interested in our latest stock tips from The Switzer Report, go to switzerreport.com.au. I've also done a piece on our economic outlook as well. That's the show for tonight. As I said, thanks for joining us.